recording is on. Okay, we're we're recording. All right, here we go. In three, two, one. Welcome to the Quiet Warrior Show. My name is Tom Dutta. I am the Quiet Warrior, and I'm so excited today. We're doing our first uh, show with multiple guests. I've never done this before, and I'm really excited to introduce you to three gentlemen. We call this the Four Penmen. Oh my gosh. Uh, this show will be broadcast on internet radio, but also available on video at some point in the near future online. Uh, so let's get started. I'm just going to open it up. Our panel is here, and uh, we're just going to go around table and uh, have each of the, the guests introduce themselves. So why don't we start with Michael Law. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Really excited about this. So Michael, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I uh, grew up in uh, Idaho, of all places, uh, born and raised, and and uh, I love uh, uh, politics and love uh, um, the history and foundation of uh, this country, uh, the United States of America, and that is what I've focused on most of my life. That's amazing, and uh, I think you've written a book somewhere there. Tell us, tell us about the title of that book. Yeah, I wrote a book. It's called The Founders Revolution, The Forgotten History and Principles of the Declaration of Independence. Um, oh, yeah. The Declaration of Independence being the uh, really kind of the document that uh, was the beginnings of uh, the United States. And uh, the principles and the history behind that are, I think, are vitally important because if we lose uh, in America, if we lose that foundation, uh, then the whole house crumbles. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Michael. Let's turn it over now to uh, Jerry Callison. Jerry, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. Tell us a bit about yourself, Jerry. Um, well, I'm an old man that uh, did a whole bunch of different things in his life and never really found what he really wanted to do until I got sick. And I've been disabled for the last six years and started writing. And I've had a ball since then. I released... Uh, my first uh, novel through uh, Morgan James Publishing uh, in 2016. I had, had to stop and think. And it's called Stranded at Romson's Lodge. And then I have self-published a novelette uh, called My Donkey and the Master that's a recounting of the gospel story through the eyes of uh, a friend of Joseph of Nazareth. And then uh, I just recently released uh, Rotund Roland, which is an anti-bullying novella. That's quite a body of work. Thank you, Jerry. And let's now turn over to John Kitson. John, welcome to the show. Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, um, my book from Morgan James came out in 2018, and uh, it's called Song of the Tree Frogs. And so I'm pretty excited about uh, just the opportunity to speak with you guys. I, uh, now, Michael, I have to tell you, um, I don't know if this is your first time, but I'm actually a relative of George Washington. So I know that you love, of course, uh, <laughs> politics and everything. But uh, yeah, see, he and I have the same great grandfather way back, John Washington. And that's where my pseudonym comes from, John Washington Kitson. So. Well, that's fantastic. Well, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tease the audience that are on radio because what's really happening here is you got these, uh, these guys on video. So you can't see what they look like. So Jerry has a set of antlers and uh, John, John has a big, long beard. He looks like Seneca. I'm just kidding you. Actually, <laughs> We have, uh, the, if you're watching this by video, you'll see uh, Michael Lawton in the background. Fascinating. He's got the American flag. You can tell that what he said. He lives and breathes this, this uh, passion of his. And uh, John, uh, John Kitson has a uh, rather seasonal setting behind him, which is probably indicative of some of his family values. And, of course, Jerry Callison. I mean, Jerry looks to me like he's in the White House doing the press show. <laughs> the in the background. Uh, but such an honor to have you. So I want to take the liberty here and tell our audience why, why we're calling this each other the four penmen. And as you probably gathered by the introductions here, uh, we all came together as authors through a common publisher. But it was greater than that. We came together because of a common purpose and connection and threads in our lives and the work we're doing. We thought it'd be kind of fun to get together on this, this broadcast and then talk about a few of the reasons why. I have three questions here. And uh, gentlemen, we're going to do a panel uh, chat, uh, free for all. Uh, so what I'm going to do is throw out each question one at a time. We'll go around the table and we'll just have some fun. Are you, on, are you guys on for that? Well, you're leaving me out again. 
Well, I should say the three gentlemen and the mouse. How's that? <laughs> okay, that works. Uh, well, you'll probably hey, keep being, if I keep being accused of being a gentleman, I'll have to live up to it. <laughs> <laughs> what the audience might have already picked up is we got a bit of a sense of humor on the show. And I think that's one of the things I love about this group. Uh, but uh, Jerry, maybe you can tell a little bit about the Tom and Jerry show later in your talk. But let's get to question number one. The first question, I'm going to put it out there and, uh, and then I'm just going to pick one of you guys to start. So the first question was, how, how the big H, how did you connect to our fellow authors, the four of us, and, and emerge as one of the four penmen? Let's, uh, let's start with uh, uh, Jerry Callison on that one. Well, I think I was the first one published uh, by Morgan James. And um, through the Morgan James um, Facebook page is where I got connected and, and really acquainted with you guys. Uh, I started uh, you know, following what you were doing and read and, and uh, reviewed your books. And uh, then through commenting on, on your posts and whatever, we, we just developed a a comradeship that uh, some of the other authors and, and we have not done. You know, I've made some really good friends through there, but uh, just the four of us seem to click together so much. Uh, I really appreciate the values that are in the books that the three of you have written. Um, you know, Tom, with, you, with your background and your history and what you went through and where it took you, in your life, and then as you realize that there were areas in your life that you needed to change, and you did something about it. Uh, John is, wrote about a situation that is, is so troubling, and is only too common, and needs to be addressed, and needs to be uh, dealt with. Um, yeah, it was an extremely difficult book for me to read, not because he didn't write it well, and not because it wasn't a good story, but because in some areas it was triggering. And um, I, I appreciate his honesty in getting it out there. And then Michael, uh, he and I are, are history buffs. Um, he may be a little bit more formally than I am, but uh, what he wrote in, the, in his book was tremendous, and I can't wait for the follow-ups. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And let's turn it over to Michael. Michael, you know, how did you connect to all these folks? I think uh, a lot of ways, uh, the same way as uh, Jerry did. In fact, uh, uh, just a little background with uh, Jerry uh, and I, when I went to uh, my son's wedding in uh, Canada, of all places, but on the east side of Canada, I know, Tom, you're on the west. Uh, I was making a stop in uh, Chicago, and he he uh, was bound determined uh, nothing was going to stop him from coming to uh, meet to meet me and i just found that uh, impressive uh, but his books uh, they have been impressive uh, i've read all three of his books that uh, uh, that he has written and uh, they're phenomenal uh, not only written well but i think the message uh, is great, and I think that's where our connection really started uh, between that and uh, between each other's books. Uh, same with John; uh, his book uh, is a, a book that had to be written. It's a inspiring book. Uh, it uh, makes me uh, want to always do the right thing because that is exactly what uh, uh, what he really wrote about is uh, somebody who is going to do the right thing uh, regardless of whatever circumstances they may be in. And Tom, your book, uh, uh, wow, that's all I can say. I mean, that's, uh, that book was just amazing and it's uh, provided uh, plenty of uh, in inspiration for me as well as a direction in how I need to go about not only just my individual life, but, uh, but life and business as well. And I think the connection that we've had uh, through Morgan James' uh, Facebook page, as well as uh, uh, others, and emails and so forth, has just been uh, such that just the connection is there. Well, well, thank you, Michael. I'll take the wow any day. <laughs> let's, uh, let's make around the, the, the corner here and uh, turn it to you, John. John Kitson, tell us about how you connected to all of us. Well, uh, Jerry is actually, I believe, um, while both you and Jerry were the first ones to reach out to me, 
uh, as a new Morgan James author, and uh, Jerry, of course, writing, you know, basically from a realistic fiction aspect that's, you know, the connection was there, and uh, Jerry reached out and said, basically, hey, um, y'all, if you, you know, I want to exchange books, you know, to read those, and, and so I did, loved uh, loved his novel. I thought, you know, once again, because it's realistic fiction, I'm a school teacher, have been for 28 years. Uh, you know, it's just, it's a great story. And anytime I can get my hands on a story like that, uh, it's always exciting. Michael's story, obviously, um, you know, with, uh, with his novel, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, a history buff, my, that was my dad, uh, ingrained that into us. I mean, it was just instilled that, uh, we were going to know stuff about history and everything. And, and, you know, once again, just the writing of, of Michael's, you know, uh, book really put me into the, just that time period. I, it was the first book that I've ever read, uh, about the history of the declaration of independence and so forth that actually felt like, Oh, I'm there. And I, you know, and I understand why they did that. And Tom, given the fact that this is brand new to me as far as business is concerned, once again, your book was perfect timing because it just hit right at that time when I was absolutely, totally nervous about, you know, where do I start from here with, you know, as being a, an author trying to promote, you know, my own work and, and, and the uh, work of, you know, fellow authors and that type of thing. Uh, so I'm really happy that uh, your book came, came my way and uh, you reached out to me and uh, you've been a great mentor to me. So I'm, I'm so thankful for all three of you because I, I think that uh, we, we've really joined together um, from a varying background. And I mean, I'm in East Liverpool, Ohio. And, and uh, <laughs> I mean, um, it's actually called the point of beginning and, uh, and it's where all the land surveying to the West started. So you guys live in areas uh, except for Tom that uh, the surveying for your property probably started right here in East Liverpool, Ohio. So I knew I was a history buff. So connecting with Michael was great, and uh, and I did uh, loan my uh, you know my my copy of uh, Michael's book to our uh, eighth grade uh, social studies teacher because he teaches American history. So <laughs> that'll be good for him. He's loving it. So. Well, that's amazing. Now I want to jump in and, and say something about that question, but I also want to just say something to inspire the audience here that here you have three gentlemen and myself, I guess I'll include myself in that group, but you know, through fortuitous intersections, that's what life's all about, right guys? We all came together, even though we published books, you know, Can Canadians and Americans who came together through the word, through the purpose through the work that we do, which is amazing to me because I know some Americans, but I never thought I'd have the type of relationships that we've developed together. Why did I connect or how did I connect you? I got a story for each one of you. I'll try to make this quick because I'm a little verbose, but uh, let's start with you, John Kitson. I remember when I saw your book, uh, Song of the Tree Frogs, I started thinking to myself, is, you know, do, do frogs actually sit in trees and sing and what the heck is that all about? But do you, rem do you remember that day when I read the first chapter of your book Yes, I, I connected to you and I went, holy crap, that first chapter could have been you writing about me and my childhood. Do you remember that? Yes, I absolutely do. Because when I read the first chapter of yours, I immediately, I actually, I sat up and I was like, whoa, okay, this is so <laughs> close, you know, I, I, like we knew each other or something. Yeah. And for the audience, especially because you don't have the benefit, and I know you're gonna, we're going to plug at the end how you can get all these books. You need to read them. You need to tell people about them. That's why we're doing this is to honor the work of the penman. But, but I remember saying that, John, you could be my br brother from another mother. I mean, that was just unbelievable. Everybody, what it was about is I came from a toxic childhood, and it was about the story was about that in John's book. Could have been me. Uh, want to flip over to you, Michael Law. I mean, I've had a great experience getting to know Michael as a Canadian, getting the book, The Founders, The Revolution, and learning about the Declaration of Independence. We didn't learn a lot about American history and, and that in, in Canadian schools, even university. And we see a lot of what happens in America through the media. And it blew my mind how well-researched and how accurately you're portrayed the information is in your book, Michael. And the last thing I want to say is that I took a trip to Victoria, British Columbia, and I took Michael's book and I put it on the war monument outside of our parliament buildings. And my wife, Anna, and I, we watched it. And within about two, three minutes, somebody grabbed it. And uh, it, it's really a, a gift. So uh, coming to know you, Michael, has been awesome, too. And, and well, Jerry, I mean, you know, I get to poke fun at you, Jerry. I mean, we, we, get on, we get on the phone and we have so much fun. 
uh, I have a soft spot for all you guys. Jerry, it's like the Tom and Jerry show. That's where that, uh, <laughs> that joke comes from. But here's the deal. I mean, I got your book, Jerry, and I saw Stranded at Rumson's Lodge, and I went, geez, I've spent 30 years of my life as a CEO, a kind of executive, and I don't read fiction or novels. So why am I going to read that book? And I picked it up, and I couldn't put it down. And I took a picture traveling through the Chicago airport to, to Nashville, Tennessee for my red carpet event, something that Morgan James Publishing out of New York does uh, once a quarter for its new authors to reveal their book on the red carpet. And uh, Jerry, I was in that lounge reading that book, almost lost, lost my flight. So it would have been on you. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was a tremendous book. And I, I, I'm just going to finish with this, that uh, a lot of executives are under high pressure jobs and the part of the brain that can create the future and we need to innovate is imagination. And Jerry, you're teaching me through your work, man, how to, how to imagine, how to dream. And uh, well, that book got passed on to my wife. She read it too. So it's just a great read. So let's move to the next question, uh, Penman. And the number two question was, why? Why did you become a published author? And explain one challenge you had to overcome in your journey to be an author. And, you know, let's start with you, John Kitson. Why did you become an author? And what was one of the challenges you overcame? Well, I became an author by accident. Uh, honest to God, wow. I never fully intended to uh, actually uh, become a you know, fully published author. Uh, what happened was I just enjoyed writing. Uh, clear back in uh, college, uh, back in, oh gosh, when was that? In the mid 80s. Uh, anyway, I took an adolescent literature class from one of my professors. I fell totally in love with uh, realistic fiction uh, from that and started writing stories just for fun. And I wrote Song of the Tree Frogs and put it on a shelf. It was there for about seven or eight years. And a friend of mine, uh, we just happened to be talking about uh, different hobbies that we're doing. I said, yeah, I like to write and everything. So to summarize very quickly, uh, she said, well, I want to see your book. I want to see the manuscript. And I said, oh, you know, this thing is a mess. You know, I haven't really edited or anything. And so sent it down and uh, she called me two nights later, bawling her eyes out at 1030 at night. And, and she said, you have to do something with it. And that's, that's how it actually happened because somebody said, I could not stop reading. I had, you know, I had to find out what was going on. And that night she revealed to me about her own personal experience, uh, about uh, abuse and everything and growing up in a very violent home. And that's what opened up my mind to the thought, well, you know what, maybe I could influence people uh, through my writing rather than just, you know, do it for fun. So that's honest. That's how I, I happened to <laughs> become a writer. That's, fa that's fascinating, John. Michael Law, how about you? Well, with, uh, with me, with my book, uh, um, I didn't necessarily have any intention to uh, write, but um, as I going through my bachelor's degree as well as master's degree uh, and focused on U.S. history and uh, government, I found that there was a, a, if there was any mention of the Declaration of Independence at all, uh, it was usually all men are created equal, and then the idea of taxation without representation, uh, which are the uh, the words that uh, we use here in America to discuss, to talk about why we uh, separated from England. Uh, but there was just no in-depth uh, uh, history or discussion of the Declaration of Independence, and and. Even going through school, I was like, uh, I just found that it was lacking, and so I felt the need that, uh, that the need that this had to be written, uh, and not just written uh, discussing it, but doing so as much as possible from the founder's point of view, because uh, even when we're discussing, even when discussed Constitution or anything like that, it always came from. Uh, what does the Supreme Court think or, or anything like that, rather than the source of where these documents came from. And that was my intention uh, to get it published. Uh, There's a lot of work. Um, I went through many agents and submitted it to uh, many publishers, and it just happened to be uh, Morgan James. Uh, when I submitted it to them, they took a look at it and fell in love with it immediately. And and uh, decided to run with it. But uh, that was, I had actually finished writing in about 2014. So, uh, and it finally got published in um, 
this year. So that tells you uh, the work that it took just to get it published. That's pretty amazing. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Jerry, I'm going to trip you up and I'm going to take next and then you can go uh, after me <laughs> just, just to keep you on your toes. I, uh, you know, my journey to being an author, I guess I'll start with what got in the way was fear. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure people listening to the show learn from all of you that how, how you can take a dream of writing a book and do it. But I never had any money. I, I thought it would cost a lot to write a book. I'd heard a lot of horror stories about traditional publishing. And uh, the second piece was my book was going to be a, a, a lot about me. And I was feeling very vulnerable that if I put myself out in the world, what would people think? And what would my father think? And what would my family think? And then I started realizing uh, through some mentorship that I had that backwards. Uh, so what happened was in the summer of 2007, this is in my book, you, people can read about it, three major events happened in my life and uh, one of them was life changing. We had uh, a, the loss of a parent and um, well, we, we got caught in a, a global uh, fraud and had a financial setback. And I got on a plane, went to Chicago, uh, Hall in Michigan actually, to see a mentor that I had found through somebody else. And at the end of that meeting, he gave me a book and it was called Thought Leaders. And I said, what's a thought leader? And he said, well, if you have an expertise or a niche in a certain space, ex he said, you, you can be a, a leader and you can use your thoughts and the world needs more of those. Uh, so I basically came back and uh, connected to a few people and started writing the book. And, uh, and that's why I did it was really to take my story and use it to teach other people uh, through my own failures, my own successes, how to navigate in life, in your personal life and in your business to achieve abundance in every area, or particularly, and I'll finish with this, that a lot of the leaders in the world, uh, they show up as, uh, you know, Teflon, but outside of the office, there's things going on or past events in life that, you know, haven't been overcome. And that manifests itself in their leadership. And sometimes they just can't, can't achieve the goals they want. And I thought, you know what, you know, maybe we can do something about that to help people who, uh, who want to move forward through things, things like that. So I'm proud to be an author. I've got a couple more books in me. So uh, Jerry, how about you? Let's uh, let's find out what your thought is. Well, you said to mention what our biggest thing to overcome was, um, and I'm going to start with that. And that would have been a college teacher. Uh, I actually flunked EN 102, uh, which is the uh, composition section of uh, of the studying the English language, and. Uh, I didn't understand why, but it, it took me quite a number of years later to understand what the difference was between what my teacher was looking for and what I could produce. And uh, she told me never to try to be a writer, that it, it was not cut out for me, that I, I couldn't do it. And for 40 years, I believed her. And for 40 years, I would write little things and I'd throw them away. And I'd, I'd write another one and I'd throw it away. And I've done, I don't know how many things that I have written and thrown away that way. But then in 2013, uh, I came down with the game beret syndrome and was disabled. It went into the chronic form and the doctor still won't release me to go back to work. So I'm pretty much stuck at the house. I, I get out and about, but I can't do a whole lot. And I, hate television. I get bored with it. I figure it out before they even get started. And I, I'm just bored with it most of the time. So um, I, I sat down and I had this story in my mind from back in the 80s. Um, much like what John was talking about, that he wrote uh, Song of the Tree Frog and then put it away. Well, this story had been in my head for you know all this time. Back when uh, uh, The Blue Lagoon came out and Paradise then some of the other coming of age stories that were out that <clears throat> I just didn't want any part of. Uh, I didn't see them, but I heard people talking about them. And you know, the idea of, of two kids being um, marooned or stranded someplace just stuck in my head. What would happen if two Christian kids who wanted to maintain their values were put in that position? What would they do? How would they handle the temptation? And, you know, where would they go with it? And what would happen? So I did a little research and, and um, I was driving over the road delivering RVs for about four and a half years. And I went through Maine quite a few times. And most of Maine is quite desolate. 
it's some of the most remote area in the continental United States, uh, parts of it with less than one person per hundred square miles. Well, there isn't a better place to be marooned or stranded than in an area like that. So that's what I use for the setting. Uh, I developed the characters in my mind and then just started telling the story. And I, I let them tell me what happened. People say that, uh, you know, your characters don't talk to you. Well, I got a hint for you. There are two kinds of people in the world that talk to imaginary people. Some of them take medication. The others are writers. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, very insightful. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, just hold on while I take my medication here. <laughs> well, I, I didn't tell you about the uh, about getting published. That's uh, another thing. I had no idea what to do with the story. Uh, all I knew was I had written it, and, and I had no clue. I didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't know. I, I thought I would self-publish because I didn't know any other options. And I went to a writer's conference just trying to learn something. And it was while I was there that I had an interview with somebody in the uh, publishing business, an editor, uh, an acquisitions editor, or something else. I didn't even know what an acquisitions editor was. And um, so uh, I, I told a young lady that registered me, I had no idea who I wanted to talk to because I didn't know what I was doing, didn't know why I was there, didn't know anybody that was. Uh, so. Uh, she said, I'm going to put you with Terry Whalen. He's been in the industry for a long time, and he's a good teacher. Uh, I sat in Terry's class, the first class, and the two of us kind of connected. I uh, went to the interview with him, and we talked for about 15 minutes just about the process and didn't even mention anything about my writing. I was looking for advice and guidance. And uh, at the end of that 15 minutes, uh, the next guy that was scheduled didn't show up. And Terry said, well, looks like we got a few minutes extra. He said, uh, tell me, have you written anything? I didn't even have enough knowledge to give him a 30-second synopsis. I didn't know to do that. <laughs> Five minutes into me telling him about the book, he said, we haven't seen anything like that in years. Would you send me the manuscript? And that's all that happened. It, it was a God thing. Um, it, it wasn't anything I imagined. I had no idea how that it would go about. I just had a story that I wanted to tell and, uh, and then just let it go from there. That's amazing, Jerry. I, you know what? I want to keep going on this question because you kind of opened up in my mind and some thoughts about the part of the question that you just opened up for us was, what was it, you know, what was it like when you, you finally took that journey? What was it like when that book came out, you held it in your hands? What was, what was it like to connect to somebody who could believe in your work? So I want to take a right turn here and open it up for a free for all. No, no order here, Michael and John jumping when you want, I'll take the lead on it that, what was interesting to me is I, I was lost. I didn't know how to go about writing a book. I didn't know you, you gentlemen, that's for sure. And I had been in business for a long time and people had given me books. I, I never even knew what a book review was, quite frankly, when somebody gave me a book. And mine was about mentorship. So one of the lessons I want to leave with the audience watching this talented group of authors is that if you, if you know an author in your life, connect to them, learn from them, because at some point you're going to have a a dream about writing a book and it's about mentorship and coaching. So I came back from uh, Holland, Michigan, uh, actually kind of depressed because I didn't know what to do. I mean, my mentor said, here, go write a book. And I got on LinkedIn and I did a word search and, the and I put in the word author and on LinkedIn, it's a business networking tool. Up came a page of 10 authors and the one at the top, I opened the link and it was the first page of her book. And uh, I read it and I was shocked. I couldn't believe somebody would write a page of a book like that. It was so graphic and vivid. So I stalked her. I reached out for a coffee. I ended up meeting her at Starbucks. And this is what she said to me, you guys. She said, Tom, she said, lean over the table here and look very closely in my, in my, uh, at my face. And as I looked at her, she looked rather odd. She said, there's seven plates of metal in my face. And she said, see these little marks beside my eyes? She said, that's where he put his thumbs and tried to gouge my eyes out. You know, here I am, this young Tommy, and I'm feeling like, oh, my God, who did I actually, who did I actually get, get here for, to mentor me? And she said, my husband brutally tried to murder me in front of my kids over and over again. And she said, I'm a victim of abuse, and I've turned that into a gift to go out and tell my story to help others. And she finished with this. She said, Tom, there's not many men in North America who will stand on a stage and tell their story of being a victim or being someone from a world of trauma. 
tell their story. You need to write. She says, go home, get a pen, get a piece of paper and start writing. And she said, I'm going to call you. And she said, I just start writing. Don't even overthink it. Get your words down. And that's really how it started for me. And then I made some connections and it came back through the Morgan James way and the rest was history. So anybody else want to sort of chime in, Michael or uh, John, about that last part of the experience? Yeah, I actually didn't uh, say much about that struggle that, that I had. Uh, the whole process of writing to me is exciting because you just have no idea where sometimes the story is going to take you, even if you have an outline or not. Yeah. Is it's I, authors are, in my opinion, some of the greatest uh, or the, the most fortunate people because we get to take our lives into a, a brand new world that uh, we may or may not want to be in, but uh, we're there. And I, um, I struggled, you know, with the editing process. My original man manuscript was 123,000 words. The final product is 78,000. Wow. Um, you know, so, I mean, uh, so I guess uh, I wish I would have that same mentality with the house. I could just, you know, clean out the clutter. But, anyway, um, but I, I had a false sense of hope early on because I, Morgan James was actually one of the last that I went to because I, I stumbled upon Morgan James, um, believe it or not, on um, uh, December 31st, the last day of the year of 2016. I just happened to be researching and, uh, and I, I just thought, you know, they look like they're a really interesting agency. And uh, lo and behold, I, you know, it worked out, of course. But my sixth query letter that I sent out uh, was uh, from one agency and I got a hit. They wanted to see the manuscript. Well, I sent it and they said, you know, uh, and, and the, uh, the agent held on to it for seven months. She was exclusive. I couldn't send it out to anybody. I had to sit and wait for seven months. She finally got back with me and she said, I love the story, would love to do it, but it's too long. And my client list is so big right now, I don't have the time to, to cut it down to, she said it should be between 80 and 90,000 words. I just do not have the time to devote to it. So I'm going to have to pass. And so that was my false sense because I hear people, you know, that send out query letters and they often wait, you know, what, 40, 50 letters before, you know, before they get a hit. And here I am, some young author, well, I'm not young, but, you know, a new author and sixth, sixth person out of, the, out of the gate and here I am. So, but Morgan James, I'm, you know, once again, as I, I believe it was uh, Jerry said it, it's a God thing because waiting until that right moment when it needed to happen, when it happened. Uh, I'll be honest with you, had my book been published three years ago, I would not have been prepared to do all of the work that I'm doing with, uh, with it as an author. So as I, you know, I agree with Jerry that sometimes you just have to wait, obviously, on God, and uh, he opens up those doors of opportunity, and here we are. Well said. God, God does have a plan. Michael, anything you want to add? Boy, have you had to... Add to that, um, add to what both of you have said and what all of you have said. Uh, in my case, uh, um, same kind of thing. Uh, I actually sent out, oh, probably the first round, um, uh, probably 60, 70 query letters uh, to get my book published. Wow. And uh, finally, after, uh, after a few months of hearing back, no, no, no. Uh, I finally started hearing back from some of the agents uh, that it was too long because it actually was uh, pushing 125, 130,000 words. Uh, and it was in three parts. And what you, what I have published or what has been published is actually just part one. Um, it was too long. So uh, I actually had to go back and do a lot of uh, revision because uh, I referred to different parts uh, in part one, which this book is. And, uh, so I had to actually include some of those things in it. Um, another interesting part is as I was uh, doing research and learning about, uh, learning from what the founders thought, um, I discovered something and I put it in the book of what their views were on slavery, uh, and the typical abusive, nature of slaveholders was not the founders. Um, and so I had to change my way of thinking a little bit uh, in view of the founders and what their way of thinking was as I learned who they really were. So it's between amazing. both of those, uh, it, was, uh, it was really kind of life-changing learning uh, 
what the founders really thought. And number two, you know, just getting it published was, uh, uh, was incredible. And interestingly, this is about the Declaration of Independence, which the war for Declaration of Independence uh, ended October 19th. And, uh, and I can definitely say that there was uh, God's hand in it because I signed my contract with Morgan James on October 19th. Wow. So the beginning of this started with on the anniversary of the date that the declaration finally <laughs> uh, won, that's, won out. So I don't know, you guys, that's pretty, pretty freaky what's going on here. My book was published on July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Canada's birthday is July 1st, but it happened to be on America's, uh, they call that Independence Day. So, wow. What, talk about crossovers. I want to take a couple more points here on my side and just build on something. There's a lot of talk about Morgan James. Are you guys okay if I touch on that for a moment? Go for it. You know, Morgan James, uh, the, the truth is, is that the founders of the company, David L. Hancock, if you go to the website, you'll learn more about this publisher. Morgan and James are the children of, uh, of the, this family. And uh, it's a legacy family business. So just like what you're seeing and hearing on this video and on the radio here, the authors have come together as a community as, and as, as a family. And that's really the nature of this company. Morgan James by Publishers Weekly has been rated as the, you know, the fastest growing pub house in America for, I think, eight years straight. What attracted me to them, though, was their hybrid model. I didn't even understand what that meant, you know, but it was a cross between traditional publishing and as an author being in the driver's seat. What I seem to hear from all you guys is that, you know, you had a lot of challenges to overcome, but, you know, you ended up being in the driver's seat to get your books done the way you wanted. And uh, I think the lesson here we want to I want to give to the audience that you're hearing from these gifted men is, or penmen, is the word persistence. And so everything starts with a thought. You know, if you have a thought to do something, you can manifest it, but persistence. Uh, I think somebody said that they had 70 or 80 letters they sent out. Was that you, Michael? Yeah, I mean, if and that was re- actually just the first round. I mean, uh, so I, after I revised, and I went through that whole process again. That's amazing. I mean, Jerry, that's just about as many Tim Hortons as we have in my backyard. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, just, but but just on that, if you know the hit, the the legendary story of Rocky, I mean, Sylvester Stallone to try and get his script accepted to be made into a movie. There's about a thousand doors that closed. So. Maury and James will get about 5,000 manuscripts a year and they'll choose maybe a couple hundred. So for all of you dreamers out there, listen to these guys and you'll find them connect to them if you want to write a book because they can mentor, well, mentor you and help you overcome that. I want to move to I our, can, yes. If sir. I can add something to that, um, mine was, I, I say it was a God thing because you just don't hear, well, you hear stories like mine, but they're not common. Uh, they're very uncommon. Uh, The idea of making one approach, I didn't even pitch the book. That was not my purpose. I was trying to learn the process. And in doing it, when I talked about the book and talked about the story, well, then Terry picked up on my vision and then took it and uh, presented. He's not even on the fiction side of the house. He goes out for nonfiction. But he sent it over to the fiction side, and they liked it too. Uh, and then what? So what I'm going to say to those who are interested in writing: number one, have a good story, and even if it's a nonfiction book, it's a story. And Tom, what you've done with yours, you know, and the advice you were given by that lady that you met with, that was spot on. Yeah, you know. So you know, don't don't look at at this as well, it's going to be this horrible process that I have to go through and I've got to send out a myriad of letters. Maybe you do, but it's worthwhile. Maybe you're going to end up like I was and have something that's the right thing at the right time for the right publisher. Okay, that is not something you have control over. The only thing you have control over is what you write and how you write it and does it connect with the reader. If you can do that, then the rest of it fits. Now, you have to find the right home for it because Michael's product would not fit in a lot of publishers because it goes counter to a lot of the more liberal thought that a lot of publishers push. And what he said about finding out what the founders really believed about um, about, uh, slavery, 
Well, isn't it amazing what happens when you find fact, how that actually changes what you might believe. So, you know, you, you don't worry about how something happens. You do the job and you present it the best way that you possibly can. And then you just let it land at the right place at the right time. If it's the first one, wonderful. If it's 180th, wonderful. You, you just do what you have to do and, and then take it from there. If I may add one thing to that, um, <laughs> what a, a great way to segue into the fact that I, um, I'm a pastor as well. And I, so I struggled. My original manuscript had a lot of swear words in it and so forth. And I always wanted it to be Christian and have a Christian theme to it and so forth. But I also knew that there were a lot of publishers out there uh, and agencies that would not even touch it with a 10 foot pole, even, even the Christian agencies. Um, and I, there weren't too many that I submitted to, um, you know, I, I just, I wanted to, I wanted it to be what it is today, which is really interesting because it took Morgan James for them to do that. I remember when I submitted and they, they had mentioned about the fact that they have about 5,000 to 6,000 submissions, you know, annually, and that they only do 12 fiction books. I thought, well, pfft, you know, this is a joke, I'll just, but I'll send it anyway. And, uh, you know, because you do have to like completely cancel your ego when it comes to query letters, you know, uh, I hate query letters. I could write five chapters in a book uh, in the time it takes me to write one page of a query letter because everybody's so picky about it, of course, and I understand why they are. But had it not been for, a, a, you know, several colleagues, uh, Brooke Harmon and, and, uh, uh, um, and Deanna Dysert, uh, who works in, uh, in, in Massachusetts, uh, and, and Carrie, another one that uh, helped me out. Had it not been for their expertise and, and helping with the editing process, I would have never submitted it anyway. So, I mean, it, it, there are a lot of outside people that really do help you. And I think my biggest fear was not driving everybody crazy, reading it just to see what do I need to change and so forth and so on. So it, it is a difficult process, but but it's very rewarding whenever you do finish and you have that book in your hand and you're like, wow, okay, it took me a long time to get here, but it's here and I almost don't even remember that stuff now. And, and I, I look at any other manuscripts that I'm working on uh, a completely different mindset now, that I'm not just doing it for fun, that I'm doing it because maybe there is a purpose in it. And uh, so that's, you know, I'm, so I'm glad you brought that up, Jerry, because I think that was a great point. Thank you. No, I mean such such learning right now on the, on the uh, on the interview. You know, they say that there's a saying. I think I saw it in the movie Moneyball that the first person through the wall gets bloody, and so you're doing your first book, and you know you kind of get that <laughs> you get bloody, but then you come out of it and you're expert. And uh, you know, I want to just mention that Morgan James has four genres of books: nonfiction, fiction, uh, children, and faith based. Right here on this interview, we have a mix of that. I wrote my book actually as a hybrid, a hybrid of fiction and business. I modeled it after Patrick Lencioni, who wrote The Four Temptations of a CEO. It was the only book I could read because I used to get bored, but it was written as a fable. So, you know, so much learning from you guys on this. I want to close on that question with the, the job of an author. What, what I've learned from all of you and from our publisher, and I want the audience to know, is that we all have a job, and it's not just to write books, but it's to educate, inspire, communicate, and entertain uh, people with our gift, but also within the community. Here we are, four of us on the line, and you know we stay connected and and uh, support each other. So I want to get to the last question, and uh, that is, I'm going to read the question out, and then uh, I'm just going to throw it out there. Somebody grab it. Um, you know, we, you all just talked about why you wrote your books, and there was some deep purpose to it. So what will the world look like when you are done with your work? this is your why what will it the world look like when you're done with your work and uh so i'm just gonna shut up and uh let somebody grab that one well i guess i'll start uh, uh when i'm done with my work uh um as uh, benjamin uh, rush said uh with regards to because he was he was told hey you're old enough you should retire um, he was a doctor. Uh, he was also a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and he said he was told that uh, he needs to rest. He needs to rest. Um, that his work is done. He just needs to, it's time for him to retire. And he said that uh, I will rest when I enter the rest of my God. 
Uh, and so uh, I don't think my work is going to be done until until I'm gone, actually. Uh, and hopefully, um, what I what I view is that because uh, I believe that the founders and their principles um, were very God based, uh, Christian based uh, individuals, and if the whole world actually lived, um, and Thomas Jefferson actually said it, and he, he being a deist, uh, and there's different levels of deism. Uh, he believed that uh, the teachings of Jesus Christ were, uh, if people followed those teachings, then this world uh, would be at peace. This world would be a much better place. The individuals would be better people. They would treat each other as they would wish to be treated. Uh, that was his belief. Uh, and he wasn't a believer in the divinity of Jesus Christ, but he still believed in those teachings. And uh, uh, I think a lot of those ideas, those concepts of Christianity can easily be found in uh, the Declaration of Independence, as well as even the Constitution of the United States. Uh, people think that there's no mention necessarily of of God in the Constitution, but there is in the very end where it says that uh, we have done this in the year of our Lord, 1787. Uh, and there's also mentioned that uh, Sundays are accepted when it comes to uh, when it comes to the president being able to sign a bill. Uh, he has 10 days from that time with Sundays accepted. The reason being is that was the Christian Sabbath. Uh, so there's definitely mention of that. And uh, not that I'm focusing on that, but those principles are principles uh, that can be found uh, throughout the Bible anywhere. Uh, and if people live by those principles uh, of of treating each other with kindness and treating each other with love, then uh, this world would be so much better off. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, what a what a purpose. Thank you, Michael. Guys, who's next? Well, I guess I'll jump in. Okay. Um, yeah. When, when I'm done with my work, I don't know when that will be. Um, Last time I checked, my body doesn't have an expiration date or uh, <laughs> best used by date stamped on any place, uh, which is probably a good thing. Um, but my purpose is to make a difference in, with my writing. Uh, I don't try to be preachy. Uh, I don't try to tell people how to live or how to think or anything else with my writing. But yet, I am a Christian. Um, I hold my values very highly. And I want to promote that through my writing. Um, is it going to be something everybody is going to accept or believe? No, it won't. Uh, not everybody believed Jesus either. So I'm not putting myself on that level. But the, the thing is, is I have a responsibility in my writing to represent Jesus Christ because he's the one I follow. And with that, my goal is with my writing to bring people to the place that they will want to at least become acquainted with Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, not all of my writing is going to have a Christian, um, Christian aspect to it. Rotund Roland, my uh, latest release, has nothing in it about God, about Christianity, or anything else. But the principles are there. Uh, a Rotund Roland is an anti-bullying story, and it's one that I want people to read to see the, the end result and, and what can happen because of bullying. Um, and as a consequence in that, um, then to make, make some changes in lives and to reach some kids with, uh, uh, number one, that there is hope, that they can, even if they are bullied, as I was, and I know you were, Tom, um, even, even if they have been bullied, they can still become worthwhile human beings that can accomplish a purpose. Um, so I, I have a purpose in my writing that there is something in there for somebody to take out and hopefully improve lives and change lives. Now, whether that's going to happen, I don't know. That That's up to the individual to determine and to decide. But um, I, I put it out there, and 
uh, Stranded at Robson's Lodge was not written as a, quote, Christian book. It was written, though, on Chris, uh, Christian principles, and those are referred to a number of times throughout the book. But it's not a book that preaches Christianity. It, it's a book, though, that tries to represent what Christianity ought to be and how it ought to be lived. Um, now, as to what things are done when my work is done, I hope I've changed some lives. I hope I've changed them for the better. It won't be until eternity that I know whether it was done or not, but uh, I'm looking forward to what happens. Well, you're making a difference in the universe, Jerry. Uh, John, how about you? Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, when I read that question that you had sent out, I thought, wow, uh, how do I answer my why? You know, um, I have to be honest with you. I don't think that my life is actually about me. Uh, it's not really about what I you know, want or what I think. Um, you know, that I'm here on earth for. Um, I'm, you know, my life uh, hardly goes the way that I plan it anyway. So, um, but I got to thinking um, with that question about uh, Galatians 2.20, um, where the Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, and that really, because that's what I was thinking about that question, I kept thinking, this really isn't about me. Um, it's about what can my writing do that will influence the lives of other people? And I thought about the different characters, you know, of my story. And, and uh, I wrote mine, um, you know, because there's a lot of books out there about abuse and domestic violence and so forth. But I wanted to write it from a different perspective. And that is the silent victims that are out there. Um, you know, we usually get the perspective of somebody that's been abused or the person is doing the abusing, that type of thing. But I wanted the silent victim's um, voice, and that is Philip, who is the older brother, uh, is the silent victim. He watches his youngest brother being brutal, you know, brutalized because of the fact that, uh, you know, their father, Tony, doesn't believe that Michael, the youngest brother, um, you know, the youngest son is not his, you know. And I thought about, you know, here's Michael, or Philip struggles with doing the right thing. Michael struggles with dealing with this, this anger and this hatred over something that he had no control over in the first place. Um, Tony, you know, seeks to destroy uh, other people's lives, but in, the, in, in turn, he destroys himself. Um, you know, their mother, she lives a life of regrets. And, and you know, Samuel that's uh, in the story, you know, he struggles with how do I reconcile with the situation that I've done wrong? These are all very universal themes, you know, that are out there. And, and I thought, I, I just need to, you know, put those in there somewhere. You know, those are biblical truths because we reap what we sow, you know, and, but it also shows how God's love is able to transcend um, the circumstances of our lives and, and for him to accomplish things. You know, Philip sees things, uh, life as a puzzle. You know, you open up the box and there's a thousand pieces and they're all broken, you know, broken apart. And, and how in the world are you going to make a past masterpiece out of that? And then I got to thinking about a stained glass window. Um, it's made up of broken pieces. And when it's all assembled together, it produces something absolutely beautiful and it allows the light to shine through. And when the light shines through, uh, it's just magnificent in itself. And that's what God's able to do. Take a bunch of broken pieces, put it together in such a way that his light is able to shine through. And that's what I wanted to put into my book. You know, so I I'm hoping that people can pick up on the universal themes that are there, but also on the biblical principles without getting hit over the head with the Bible itself. And uh, so far, a lot of people have said that. And, and Morgan James decided to go ahead and not only put it in general fiction, but also as Christian fiction as well, and Family Saga, of course. But, um, you know, I just think that God can use the circumstances of our lives uh, for greater good. And you know what? If the Lord can use a jackass, he can use me. That's the reality <laughs> that I have. And uh, so, you know, but that's, that's sort of where I, I, I approach that from. Uh, but as far as how long is this going to go? Uh, well, I don't know. I'm going to steal something from Rodney Dangerfield. He basically said he couldn't donate his body to science fiction, and neither could I. So <laughs> I have no idea when, you know, but I'm just, right now, I'm just enjoying the ride and just, um, and just seeing what doors of opportunity, when you have people that call you on the phone and say, I read your book, and I, can I share something with you that's personal? And I'm, you know, sure, go ahead. I mean, as a pastor, I have to, you know, be confidential anyway and people open to open up to me about the very you know for the very first time to anybody about 
the abuse that they also suffered as a child. And so, and, and that is not me. That is not me. That is just a book that has somehow connected with somebody's story and with their own personal circumstances, and they've just developed from there, and you just don't know. So, I mean, it's such an honor to, to be a, an, an author in the first place, but it's an honor to watch how each of your books have influenced different people in, in different ways. And uh, so, and that, I think that's, that's just the joy ride. You know, it's, it is a roller coaster to be an author, but it's, it's, it's a joy ride. So, I, I, that last, that last line, it's a joy ride. You know, we had to go back and, uh, and share that, uh, the being an author is a joy ride. That's amazing. I, I, I want to just say that there's so many connections in this interview. We have about five minutes left. I'm just going to say that we just heard about a jackass. I think Jerry wrote a book about a donkey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I don't know, Michael, you've probably got uh, a Japanese, uh, horse or something in there. You spent some time teaching in Japan, I heard. Um, but I want to bring this all together, gentlemen, and then I'm going to put you on the spot with one last quick ask, which is to tell us about your body of work, where to connect to you. And I'm going to get you to start thinking about a uh, little known fact. So we didn't script this, but I want to hear as you wrap up in just a few minutes, I'll cue you. Uh, a little known fact that you think nobody really knows about you, something you, you can share to, to inspire us. But uh, let me take what I just heard for the sake of our audience and bring it all together. I mean, I'm just vibrating in my chair. I'm mesmerized by the fa fact that what we're hearing here from four separate authors, did you guys catch this? There's a common thread through all of our stories. So, you know, my, my why, my purpose beyond my book is really, I wanted to write a book to unleash greatness in other people. Uh, there's millions of quiet uh, warriors around the world. These are people with broken souls who uh, have had traumatic pasts. A lot of what they believe about themselves was put in them by others, and it's not even true. That they, yet they don't have a voice, and yet when you tell your story, uh, if one person looks at that story and says, that's mine, and it gives them hope and inspires them to be better, to get on a new pathway, that's why I wrote my book. And uh, through that, the world will be a better place. I believe there's a connection that hurt people hurt people. You've probably heard that saying. And there's a connection to so many areas of society, homelessness, addiction, terrorism, you name it, uh, toxic relationships, uh, because of people who are just lost souls and they haven't quite found their way. So if we look back at what we just heard, I mean, there's uh, Michael talking about uh, make the world a better place. Just to quote something Michael said, uh, Jerry, you know, make a difference, change lives. And then John, the silent voices. I mean, it's incredible. And here I am saying, I want to unleash greatness, make the world better. That's the magic about what we've got through all the work. And that's the magic about what you gentlemen are doing, being an author. So I'm so proud to be part of this group. I also want to say that there's uh, hundreds of Morgan James authors in our community. And, and uh, when we learn about the titles of each other's books and we're out doing our work and somebody says, you know what, uh, I, I just had uh, somebody who passed away from Alzheimer's. And uh, we might say, you know what, we know, we know somebody who's written a book about that or uh, any one of your books, uh, we can refer. So uh, that's the beauty of being part of a community of thought leaders. Uh, so let's, let's move to wrap this up. I want to go around table. I'm going to call on each one of you. Uh, just give it a plug. Tell us where to get your body of work. In other words, where to get your book. You might have a website. You might want to give out a contact. And uh, tell us a, uh, what I call a little-known fact, something about you that you think uh, people don't know about. Uh, so let's... Uh, I know right to John Kitts and John, let's start with you. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, actually, I wanted to tell Jerry real fast that uh, I, I finally uh, did receive um, uh, his latest book. And, uh, but it was right at the beginning of filming a movie. Um, so uh, I will get to that. Um, we finally, uh, things are settling down. Not uh, hurry at all. Uh, yeah, my uh, my book. Uh, I do have a website www.jwkitson.com uh, is one place to get. And of course, all of our books are available through you know major bookstores and so forth. So uh, you can check those out. Um, uh, anybody that orders from my website, I do autograph that that book. So um, anyway, a uh, little known fact about myself. Holy smoke. Um, Oh, geez. That's a tough one, Tom. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I am, I thoroughly enjoy singing. There you go. Uh, All right. 
and of course, that, so uh, I enjoy doing that uh, and Southern gospel music. So there you go. That's my little known fact. But other than that, um, I don't know. <laughs> you know what? That's about as perfect as it gets, uh, singing frogs and uh, a singing yep. author. Uh, you got it. So Let's go to the right here on my screen to Michael Law. Michael? Well, you can go to my uh, website at michaellawauthor.com and get my book there, as well as it's in bookstores everywhere. Uh, if you go to my website and get it there, uh, it also, like John, it will be uh, a signed uh, copy. Uh, a little known fact about me, um, well, that's a tough one. Uh, I guess there's one that I haven't uh, posted anywhere or mentioned anything is uh, found out just a couple of weeks ago. I'm soon to be a grandfather. Oh, hey. so, oh. all right. Let's give him a hand. It's awesome. Be a new experience there. Well, thank you. And uh, God bless. That is fantastic. Your life will be never be the same, Michael. <laughs> yeah. Let's hop over to uh, Jerry Callison. Jerry. Well, uh, the easiest place to get my works are through uh, my website, uh, www.jlcollison.com. And Collison is spelled C-A-L-L-I-S-O-N. Uh, every book that goes through there is signed and uh, is personalized. If you want it uh, uh, multiple copies or if you want them to go to somebody else, uh, I'll be happy to sign it to that individual if you just let me know. Um, and then uh, uh, Stranded Ross's Lodge is available through any bookstore. Uh, most of them don't carry them any longer, but uh, they can be ordered. Uh, and of course, they're available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble online, uh, even Walmart.com. Um, and uh, as far as uh, My Donkey and the Master and Rotund Roland, uh, they're both available through uh, Amazon and uh, through my website. Uh, and uh, My Donkey and the Master is available as an ebook through smashwords.com. Um, and a little known fact about me is I never competed in the Miss America contest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. I wouldn't have expected anything less, sir. Um, well, a little, my little known fact is that I was, I, I think I was very open in my book about myself, but I don't believe I told you that I was born in the United Kingdom on a military base and actually born halfway in the backseat of a cab. And uh, my mom always likes to remind me that explains a lot. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to wrap up this uh, by telling you about where to get my body work. I mean, I, I have an advantage because the radio show is about me, but I want to make the spotlight on the penman today. My body work includes the quiet warrior show. You can get that on iTunes or any online radio show. Uh, my book, the way of the quiet warrior, you can find it at all on and offline bookstores. I have a website, uh, create K R E A T with a K dot C A. I have a book page and a media page. Uh, my company is a leadership development company. We work on, developing people to be better people, better leaders. And so everything's there. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to check out and find this show and give it a rating. Once we release it on iTunes, you just find it and subscribe to it so we can honor uh, Jerry, John, and, and Michael. I want to finish with uh, a bit of a, a reveal about a study that was done in Canada. This is a Canadian study, so we consider ourselves part of America with this. And the study was done of 90-year-olds, and they asked the 90-year-olds, what, uh, what age 90, what are, what are some of your biggest regrets? And after all the data came in, they, there was three regrets. Uh, they regretted that they didn't take enough risk. They regretted that they didn't reflect enough. And uh, they regretted that they didn't leave a big enough contribution or legacy. So whether you become an author, or do the kind of work that uh, Jerry, uh, John, and Michael and I are doing, you know, make sure that uh, you do something to give – give back and uh, that you don't have regrets uh, as you move on from this life. So gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to wrap this up. Everybody find that true passion and purpose like you've heard today and uh, live the life that you deserve and desire. And uh, guys, thanks for being here. Let's do it again, again. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Pleasure. Thanks. Thank you.